to when we New Orleans or Wams, <laughs> as some folks like to call us. When we start saying we believe in Jesus Christ, and they say, Y'all don't believe in the same Jesus Christ we do, he said, You're right. You're very true. The Jesus Christ you believe in can't be found. <laughs> and that's why you still are believing in him. The Jesus Christ we're talking about has been found. If you find the Father, you will find the Son. <laughs> you follow that? You're right. We may not be talking about the same Jesus. We're not talking about a little Jewish boy 2,000 years ago. You're right. <laughs> we're talking about the one that's on the wall. Like Daniel said, the writing is on the wall. We're talking about the one you can see, hear, taste, smell, and feel. We're talking about the Jesus that y'all are now having to bear witness to. We're talking about God the Father, God the Son, and the Blessed Mother, but they are found, no longer living in a mystery. Otherwise, the statement in the Bible, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, is bull. Because to know the truth, I'm not working on belief of faith. You see what day and time we're in? Oh, by the way, that's another thing they don't like. They don't like when we use the word God. So they say, no, they believe in more than one God. And then they say, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And then they say, but they're all one. You know, like a egg. There's the shell. There, right? There's the bayard. And there's the yolk. See? All three in one. I say, and becoming. And what are they becoming? That's not the finished product. The egg is not the finished product. The egg is a process going forward to becoming something. So, are you telling me God is incomplete in a trinity? And he's in the process of going to become something? What is it he's becoming? Where is he going? But in ancient Egypt, we no longer have to look for the mystery. We no longer have to be banging on doors and hoping that the truth is behind them. They all prayed and screamed and cheered and hoped that their form of Jesus Christ would show up in the year 2000. They were set. They were happy. You remember them? When all telling Jesus is coming now, we were like, yeah, right. Jesus was coming by the year 2000. You know who ended up coming? Osiris. He did come because the Egyptians dug him up and found his body. It's not a myth no more. He did come. How are they going to deal with that? And if he came, who else came? Huh? Isis came. Oh, I see. And if Isis came, who else came? Horus. And if that's true, then the story of Tehuti being there, Satuch being there, all of these other men and all these other people that are on the walls in Egypt that they kept telling us were paganistic myths are becoming real. Can we deal with our own truth? Or do we continue to live in their lives just because we're adjusted to it? Just because it feels comfortable to us? Are we willing to stand up and face the facts and tell people we found Christ, which was being interpreted the Messiah? We found a man who you had us worshiping, but you had us worship him in what? In your image. And we were warned in the book of Revelations they describe the devil to us. You know how you know they describe the devil to you? Because when they describe Christ to us, and Christ is the Son of God, check it out now. They describe Christ, right? What they say? He had hair like lamb's wool. They describe someone who's colored. So if he's the Son of God, and that's his description, I don't have to ask you for the description of the devil. I know the devil is going to be the opposite description of God. I don't have to ask you what the devil look like. I got the devil here and God here. Do I have to look in that direction if I see God? No. You may not like to hear white people are the devil. Especially when you're in a country ruled by white people. For a little while. We may not want to digest that. That's kind of frightening whenever you sheriff, cop, police, teacher, fireman, judge, lawyer, and most people with money are all Caucasian. Now that don't mean all Caucasians are devils now. Because we got some black devils, let's be real. Must I go there? Because you know, every now and then you start talking about Caucasian 
being devil. Black people start thinking that they ain't devil. I know a whole bunch of niggas devils now. <laughs> devil is doing this work, y'all, 24 hours a day, <laughs> fighting our families amongst us. That's why Jesus said, what? Who betrayed Christ? His own. They may have betrayed him to the Romans, but they were his own Jewish people who came to him, so-called Levite priests, and said, you know, we don't stone you for the fact that you say this. We stone you for the blasphemy that you say you're the son of God. Right in St. John, Jesus answered and said, well, isn't that reason why all you the children of God? Isn't that not in the Torah? Isn't that not in the book of Psalms? Didn't Dawood, David get this? Didn't it say in the law, all you the children of God, what? Ilion, Ilion, El, in Hebrew. It throws me off in English. Right? You may be, you may be a God, but you are a son and daughter of the Most High. That's God's way of saying, you can be as cocky as you want to be, but don't start thinking you're me, because I will, um, you know, push you down the stairs a couple of times. <laughs> God has a way of pulling the rug on up the money we get a little too cocky. Right now, Muslims go to Mecca and they're all getting this God complex. And yeah, they go, there's a plague. There's a disease. There's something that collapses. Why? You know why? Because them Muslims are out there taking God's laws in their own hands and justifying terrorism and saying, Allah said do this. Allah said do that. Allah makes rain, hell, snow, and earthquakes. He don't need you blowing up no buildings. If Allah is God, he has the power to blow up a building if he wants, don't you think? But a whole bunch of guys are sitting around who are bored after they didn't read the Quran and fumbled through the Hadith, ate a couple of dates. I know, I've been in them cyber circles in the East. They ain't got nothing else to do. They heard the Quran everywhere it could be recited in every direction you can take it. And they are bored. The real Arab is all wrapped up in the Quran and he's waiting for the fire and brimstone to come and him going to heaven and getting black eyed maidens. That's all he's thinking about. But there's another group to the board and they take Allah's job into their own hands and say, I have the right to do this. That's what's going on in Israel right now. The Jews want Solomon's temple. The Muslims say, we call it Masjid al-Aqsa and it's ours. The Jews said, no, if the Quran says that it came from the Torah or the Old Testament and the Injil, the revelation of the Evangel, then this is really our building. Correct? You hear the conversation? And people are getting blown up and killed because of that. You know where the mistake comes in? Huh? It doesn't belong to Muslims or Jews. It's Bait Allah. It's supposed to be God's house. That's where the problem's coming in. You're fighting over God's house. You're claiming that this holy temple in Jerusalem is God's temple. But the Jews say, no, it's our temple. The Muslims go, no, it's not. It's, and the Christians are afraid. They ain't here too. <laughs> they ain't strong enough in Jerusalem to say, no, they're really hurt. They say, they're going, it's our temple too. <laughs> and now there's people over there blowing each other up and killing each other. You follow? Only because they're dealing with faith. Only because they're dealing with belief. Because they haven't sat down at a table together and said, let's go through the scriptures and see. First, let's see if the scriptures are true. These people are killing each other over faith and belief. And if you came to them with the truth, they would pass. That's why I wrote that book, Jesus Found in Egypt. I want to see how they get around it. You know me. I write books just to see what happens. You know what I mean? I just write a book, you know, let me see, 360 questions to ask the Muslims. I just want to see if they can answer. And it says 360 questions a day. And the Israelites over here going, where's our book? They want me to. Anybody, anybody else want a book? We got one for you. You can ask anybody 360 questions. Well, not they can answer what's important. And the answers are coming out of nature. The truth is manifesting itself in front of us. But we're afraid Tamahus, another word for Caucasians, have Egypt on television every week. They're on their third mummy movie. Just last week they were talking about the other one, uh, with the Prince of Egypt. They did Cleopatra over four times in the last five years. If you check import, they got more Egyptian statues. You go to any bookstore, take a major bookstore like Borders, and go into the Egyptian section. And you find hundreds of books on Egypt. Every white person in the world is writing about us. And they see their noses. 
They see them lips, they definitely can't miss Uncle Lincoln's lips. <laughs> they see them big old noses, they see men do hold their black skin. When they cracked open, took on an almond stool, they saw two black guys standing like this. <laughs> they wasn't brown, they wasn't beige, they were bold lack. <laughs> That's B O lack. <laughs> So we have two of them, but we make sure we put it right there in front of the bowl lock furnace. So when you walk around, every time you walk around, you go, two niggas. <laughs> and I do that because I want you to know that every time a white person walks by and sees the two stabs, they go, two niggas. <laughs> and they'll spend their last dollar going on vacation to Egypt. Go to France. Go to Germany. Go to Sweden, which is near Germany. Go where else? Holland. Where else they come from? Where else can they go? Denmark. Where else they came from? Where else? Norway. Hell. Where else? Go to. Why are so many white folks in Egypt? I went to the university in Egypt, in Cairo, and you can see bus loads of them. Bus loads of old little chickens. Coming to the hotels, you know, walking around the permits, looking in the permits, seeing your face there, saying, my God, which is not, dear God, but my God, look. <laughs> then go down, then they make the gravest mistake, they get on a boat and they float down to Aswan. When they get down to Aswan, they might as well be in Holland. <laughs> I'm saying, the only difference is the language. The body language is the same. You see Nubians, but you see them by the hundreds all over Egypt. Why are they there? Because they want to know the truth. They want to see it for themselves. They heard about it their whole life. They heard that the niggas in America are the lost tribe. That y'all are the original Hebrews. That y'all are the original Ishmaelites. The original Israelites. All them tribes they mentioned in the Bible and some more. You say, well, how can we be all of that? Look around here and look at all the different faces. Look at all the different shaped eyes and noses. Someone meticulously went out and started grabbing people from the Ashante, from the Mandinga, from the Yoruba, from the Hausa, from the Dongola, from the Jalia, from the Sharia. I can just go on. They picked a whole bunch of us. Some got wavy hair. Some got nappy hair. Some got that hair that you can't call nappy because you don't know what it is, it just sits there. <laughs> I got a son with hair like that. It's like, you sure this is hair? And yes, you can't comb it, you can't do nothing. Perm just leave. Perm just leave. Perm just says, no, I want nothing to do with this. <laughs> you ever see people hair like that where each knot look like they screwed it in one by one? And then, I don't know what time after they came, I ain't seen them. The nappy headlights or something, I don't know. But we have people with every texture here, every shape nose, every color eye. That's because some of y'all are Israelites, some of y'all are Ishmaelites, some of y'all are Nubians from Egypt, some of y'all was brought here from Congo, some of y'all from Kenya, some of y'all from Uganda, some of y'all are Ethiopians. Y'all are made up of all them tribes. If you, uh, let's say, scan through a book throughout Africa, you start seeing people like, shoot, they go route. Am I lying? You be like, I look like Ralph. You know, you walk up and say, what's up, Ralph? Who look at you? We are a great people. I ain't got to keep pumping this in your head. You are those African tribes. You always were Yoruba. Islam is something that they gave you. Islam is simple silliness. I was born a Muslim. It's silliness. It don't make no sense when you get right down to it. But it, in its pristine purity, before it got adulterated by opinions and philosophies and hadiths and traditions and customs, was beautiful. Because it said a state of peace. But you know what it said in the Quran? Muslims greet each other with the statement, Assalamu alaikum fi jannah. Fi jannah. In Arabic, that means in paradise. That's when they say salam alaikum. That's what the Quran says. It never says that a Muslim should greet another Muslim on the streets on earth and say assalamu alaikum. 
If any Muslims who are ex-Muslims or still Muslims know that I'm telling you the truth. It said the place is called in paradise. It says Dar Islam. Dar Islam. Dar means the abode or place of peace. You see what I'm saying? And that was in heaven, not on earth. Allah doesn't expect for us to have happiness on earth. You understand me? And Jesus answered him like this. Bless are the, for they shall be called. Talking in the future. Jesus spoke about Muslims in the future. Bless are the peacemakers. They make it look like Jesus Christ is coming with the very end, and that's not true, because he says in St. John's, I'm gonna send another comforter. They spoke about a comforter coming, a spirit of truth, right? After Jesus. But then Rasulullah Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam came, Muhammad did, as a comforter. But Muslims thought it was over then. You know what happened? The disciples of Muhammad gathered with him in the Surah Al-Baqarah, second chapter, 214 verse, and they asked him, Mata Nasrullahi Ya Rasulullah, Mata Nasrullahi, when is the Nasrullah coming? And he says, Ila Nasrullahi Qariban. Surely the help from Allah is near. Qareeb in Arabic for coming soon. Now here Muhammad is here on earth. They call him the last prophet, the seal of the prophets. You with me? Yet when his disciples ask him in the second chapter, 214 verse, when, tell us Muhammad, when is the help coming? Muhammad's answer is, surely the help is coming soon. Ain't that deep? And he named the help. He said, in the Nasrullah, in the Nasrullah, Qariban, the Nasrullah. Then as you go through the Quran and you ask a Muslim, what is the word for Christians in the Quran? They say Nasr. Jews are called Yahudi. Then they're Sabians. But the Christians are called Nasr. And in the Holy Quran, right, 61, 14, they call Jesus' disciples, what? They say Nasrullah. Jesus said, men, Nasri, who are my helpers? They said, in the Nasri, in the Nasri, Allah, surely we are Allah's helpers. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu kunu ansar Allah. So, all you who are believers, or faithful, or true, or worshippers of Amun, become ansar Allah. They didn't leave Amun out of the New Testament, you know. Amun followed faith through the whole New Testament, and Jesus in Revelation chapter 3 verse 14, right, says what? Amun, the faithful, the true witness, the deity that witnessed the beginning of creation of God, it says. Right in your Bible, the book of Revelation. That the deity called Amun, and it's in a noun form. It's not to be used as a verb or a transfer. It's a noun. They said, Amen, the faithful witness, the beginning of the creation of God. This person or this being called the Amen in Revelations witnessed Jesus' birth. The creation of God. And Jesus was God in flesh according to the Quran. Say, what? According to the Quran, Jesus was God in flesh because the Quran refers to Jesus as Kalim Allah. The first is Jesus as Ruhu Allah. Ruhu in Arabic means the wind from Reh, the breath, the soul. Calls Jesus the Ruhu Allah. Calls him Kalim Allah. Kalim Allah means the very words that come out of my mouth. Remember he said he should not speak of himself, but only that which he hears shall he speak. He should glorify my name. Call Jesus in the Quran the words of Allah. The soul of Allah said that Jesus spoke while he was yet in a crater. He was an infant. He hadn't mastered the art of vocalizing. He hasn't mastered the art of speaking yet because he was still in the crater. Yet he held conversation. The Quran tells you how that happened by saying Jesus was the spirit of Allah and the word of Allah. 
That means God's spirit was in that child and that child was speaking on behalf of God. Otherwise, no little infant in no cradle can talk. Am I right? Will a Muslim bear witness to that fact? No. They will wrestle with that all day. For it's right there in front of you and out of it. But if you read the English translation of the Quran and you didn't learn the Arabic language or it's not your mother tongue, you'll never see it. And that's why they come to America and give them Yusuf Ali, Mulana Muhammad Ali, picked off, Dagwood. And they could have spent the years that they were Muslims, the Arabs could have built universal all the kind of money they have and made sure every American Muslim was fluent in Arabic. You know what their greatest fear is? One day somebody's going to do an online Quran the way they did an online Bible. Understand? Where you can look at every word and see its true meaning. Because the moment people can analyze a Quran like that, that's the end of Islam as they know it. None of the practices that they implicate today would show up. Nowhere in the Quran does it tell you to touch your hood, to sit on the floor and point your finger like this. It's not there. Nowhere in the Quran it says put your fingers behind your ears. It's not there. Quran doesn't say pray five times a day. Quran says pray seven times. And how can you pray five times a day and make salat to Isha? Listen again before you question. How can you be praying five times a day and make Surah Al-Asha? What is Surah Al-Asha? That's the night prayer. So there's not five prayers daily. You know what I'm saying? Now how many prayers are there daily? First let's establish daily. Every time I talk to y'all, I like to tell y'all something you never heard before. Ain't that what I do? Let me tell you something you never heard before. Right? Sunday. Say Sunday. That means sun and day. Right? What's Monday? But the sun is still shining. Let's do it again. Let's say it again. Sunday. You with me? Got it? And that means the day as the sun shines during the Now we come to Monday's moon day. How can you have moon day? It's moon what? Right. Now, let's go to the next one. Now we got Tuesday. Now what is Tuesday really? No, Tuesday is really Sunday. Just as Monday is really and any day that the sun is shining is called Sunday. Now why did they trick us? You know why they trick us? Because they got us to the point where we believe anything they say and we don't critique it. We haven't stopped. See, now that I said it, you go, some niggas are saying, I knew that all the world. I don't mind y'all, it's cool. It's all right, it's all right. But the deep thing is, just think about what they did to you. You been walking around and see me Monday morning. All right? No, better yet, meet me Monday night. Meet me Monday night? Say Monday night. Ain't something wrong with that in right knowledge? How can you have a Monday night? Is there a such thing as Sunday night? No, but once it becomes night, it's no longer sun. So now we have to change everything in our vernacular around and say stuff like Sunday and sun, right? Uh, what? Mon? No. No, mon night is in the morning. Because the moon is out. So if it's mon, the moon is there. I don't care if the sun is shining or not. If you call it mon, the moon is there. Sun and the moon can't shine at the same time according to them. Right, so it's moon night, which means it don't make no sense, so we gotta get rid of it. Now we done lost a whole period of time. If I didn't say that, y'all gonna say a whole day. <laughs> That's how well the program, you know what I'm saying? Watch, you have lost a whole, you see how you instinctively wanna go whole? That's how you know the spell was in there. Are you with that? All right, now if that happens with days, how do weeks, become weaker than days if there's more time in a week than there is in a day. Well, better yet, shouldn't the second be the week? Because at least with a second, you get another chance. <laughs> so, shouldn't it really be week, 60 weeks, 
make up a minute. Now, you say, oh, no, um, you're looking at me like, is he misspelling the week? <laughs> is he missing, mistaking W-E-E-K with W-E-A? Listen, phonetics is the same. The people speak first or write first. Right, so they had to figure out that that didn't make no sense and create a second word. You understand? That's why there's wake. You hear how wake sounds? Wake me. Wake me up. Shake me. You see what they did? They tied in tones that entrap us. I'm going to tell you, Christ, crisis, look how close that is. You see the entrapment in the mind? Christ and crisis. These are all part of a plot that enslaved us mentally and made it capable for them to just about say anything over the media and control the way we feel about what we hear. You understand what I'm saying? As they talk to us, because they have control of phonetics, in other words, they put letters to match phonetics to create tones, which have various meanings. Let's take a word that can have various meanings and has the same basic phonetical sound. Even though people could get technical and say, well, bear, B-E-E-R, and bear to be bare naked, and the bear that attacks you, actually, on all different words, right. But who speaks that clear? Who actually really distinguishes when they're talking? And don't say y'all, because y'all niggas say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see you later. There ain't no word I'm in the dictionary. I'm a, where you going? Where you going, man? Where you going? What's your name here? We didn't like this, so we changed it to B. What's your name be? Who he? The nigga with you. Who he? Yeah, where you go? Yeah, who that? Who that? Who that is? That's it. Who that is? What you, what you say? What you say? What's what you say? What you say? But that's all done purposely. Tones. Because that's why you can listen to certain music and it can make you feel sad. If I put on some Calypso, everybody gets a certain feeling. If I put on James Brown, you could call James Brown country. And you could be a city slick nigga. But James Brown will make a city slick nigga pat his foot. Something about the magic of James Brown's rhythms that make you start doing this. Certain musicians got magic. And they can get on out. Michael Jackson, I mean, for whatever he turned out to be, he had beats that I don't care who you are. You can say, I don't like him. You know, I don't like what he did to himself. He cut off his nose and he, some nigga with a perm is saying, he cut off his nose and he, he bleached out his skin. And they got three holes in their ears up here. Ain't no reason for him to do that. Why you? You can say that there, but when his music starts playing, like Billy Jean, you be thinking like, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> Am I lying? No. Or is that the truth? That tells you there's some magic in music. That means there's some magic in tone. And that's why there's a concentrated effort to remove our languages from us and have us speak in English. They don't want nobody who speaks Spanish speaking Spanish. They don't want no Latin speaking people because there's tones in the language. Not the way we're speaking it in Harlem, where we didn't mixed in English a bit, but the way our grandparents spoke it. And most of the kids couldn't understand it. I had relatives that spoke Portuguese, I didn't understand what the hell they were talking about. And they was they were just going like this, okay. Yeah. Only time I worried when the hand went up. No, not no, no. Not when the hand went up. When the hand was coming down. <laughs> when the hand was up, I still could get out of the way. There's a concentrated effort. That's why there's so much being put into Nawapi. There's a concentrated effort for you to eliminate, what nationality are you? American. What's your nationality? You American? What's your nationality? Huh? You American? I ain't got you then. What nationality are you? British. <laughs> Egyptian. Egypt. Egyptian. That's another thing. We have to stop being everything but Nuwapians. That is our nationality. We're not Trinidadians. We're not Cubans. We're not Dominicans. We're not British. 
where Nuwabi is. You know why that's important? Because we hold the secret to its meaning. Sit with me for on a minute. We hold a secret to its meaning. Nobody knows what a Nuwabian is but us. And if they decide to put it in their definitionary or dictionary, they will have to come to you. We have now introduced a word into the world. Right? Regardless of what they say, they don't know what it means. They ask you, sound right reason. And it doesn't mean sound right reason. You're right, it doesn't mean sound right reason. But we're not going to tell you what it means until you tell us what Caucasian means. Do you understand what I mean by that? Because what you're reading in the dictionary doesn't necessarily mean that's what Caucasian means. That's because there's a mountain between the Black and Caspian Sea called the Caucasus Mountain that doesn't mean that's what it means. And as many words as we capture, the meaning of is how we establish ourselves. Because they have to come to us to ask what we mean when we say Nwabi. When we say Rahubat. They say, what does that mean? It means Rahu bat. <laughs> what the hell does hello mean? I mean, how we know about hello, we you know about that, but other than that, hello means what? Hello, right? Hi, hi, hi. Oh, no, it depends. No, I got a friend, who's, he's a different kind of hi. Nah, he's always hi. I'm talking, you know what I mean, the greeting. You introducing that. You bothered them with the word anu. What is this God y'all call anu? And y'all went in the Bible and showed them in the Bible. There it is right there, anu. Pagan. <laughs> Say, define the word pagan. You know what pagan means? Jamaican. How? It means Jamaican. You know why? Because Jamaicans are yard people. Yard gal, yard man, and the word pagan means in the yard. <laughs> Look it up in a dictionary. It means in the yard. So all the Jamaicans are pagans. No, you do that because in doing that, you dissolve his plot. You follow that? When he calls you an atheist, you say, atheist, other than what? You know, hey, what's atheist? I'm against theos. Well, shouldn't it be a god? In America, you can't be an atheist in America. I know that sounds crazy. You can't be an atheist in America because the word theos is a Greek word. And nobody's walking around here speaking Greek. So how can you call me an atheist in America? What would you have to call me? A, a god. A means against a god. So a god. And that would be wrong because god is a German word, hut. So you'd only be able to call me an a god if we was in Germany. So what am I? You, as Nuwapians, are supposed to diffuse bull crap. That's your job. Your job is when you see bull crap, you diffuse it. I've written enough books, breaking down enough things, that when someone talks to you, it's almost a pleasure for you to take them apart, piece by piece, and I always say, put them back together. I don't need a brother or a sister walking like this down the street. That's some heavy shit that nigga just said. Put them back together, because y'all can mess a nigga up. You don't know that when you've been a Christian your whole life and someone just comes in one day and just snatches the whole world from under you and say, Jesus was not crucified. They go, what? Jesus was not crucified. God cannot die for one minute. See, there's a difference. If I start questioning my sin, can God die? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, God can't die. Can God die for an hour? No, 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 no. Can God die for a minute? Oh, no, 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 no. Can God die for a second? No, no, no. So God cannot die, right? No, he don't. All right, I'll leave you there. I'll walk, talk to you for 20 minutes later, I'll come back and say, when a person dies, do they give up their spirit? They go, yep, 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 according to the Bible. So if I'm dying, my soul leaves my body and goes to heaven. Yep, 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 yep. Can God's soul leave his body and go to heaven? Nope, 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 nope. So God's soul cannot leave his body in heaven. Nope, 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 nope. So on the ninth hour, when Jesus is on the court, you, you trick me. You trick me. That's what they'll tell you. They're smart. They're dumb. They go. You know, they get that dumb look like a dog goes. I'm saying. And he said, when Jesus was on the cross, the ninth hour, he gave up his ghost. 
So he died. If God died for one second, how much havoc could Satan reap on this planet? If God was busy on the cross resurrecting and going through all the stuff that they need while his hands were there and his feet was bound, while he was like this, he able because someone said, come on now, man. Right? Then I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I'm going to do you a favor. I got power with the Roman Empire. You understand? I can get you down off that cross. Okay? So yeah. If you really want to get down to cross Jesus, just raise your right hand. That's all. Raise that right hand, you down here. For the whole purpose of nailing him to the cross is to make him immobilized, right? Make him unmobile. Can God ever be unmobile? You don't have to approach the God not being crucified by Jesus because if you identify Jesus as God, then you are attributing things to him that are impossible and still remain God. Right? Because God can't be immobile. God cannot be confined to any one place at any one time. God cannot die God cannot be born. You follow? God cannot give you anything. You understand what I mean by that? God cannot give you a thing. Not even intelligence. What has God given you? Nothing. You like to believe that God has focused on you and has given you things, but God has given you absolutely nothing. Now, I know God personally. See, I'm different. I know him personally. I'm saying, I'm saying. He lives, well, he moves around a lot according to them. Sometimes he's in sometimes he's not. See, I live on the third floor, right? God lives on the fourth floor, two doors down from me. That's where he lives at. And I go by his house every now and then, I talk to him. And I say, God, that's what we call him. <laughs> now, who here don't believe me? Uh, who here don't believe that I know God, he lives, you know, there's two floors up for me, a couple of doors down, who don't believe me? Oh, look, just went over there. Yo, man, yo, I'm not kidding. He just was walking over there. He's sitting down right over there. He's sitting right over there between that pole. Hey, God, what's up? He's sitting right there. <laughs> now, who don't believe it? Why not? Huh? Can you prove he's not over there? Okay, tell me who God is to you. I am God. The people around me. You. Anybody who's in control. I knew. Pakalum. The all. Is the all the same as everything? So, yeah. So he's not over there? <laughs> uh, is he over there? Are we on it. Yeah, same God, same station. <laughs> so God lives next to you. <laughs> right? God walks with you. God could be two floors up and two doors down in your apartment building. You see how truth can look stupid until you get to the bottom of it? God could be here. God could be there. God can. That's right. God can do everything and anything less than being God. So even God in his mercy, you heard these years ago. And his wisdom has left room for the intelligent. You know what I'm saying? By saying I could do anything but be less than myself and still be me. He left room for you to indulge the thought. That's how merciful he is. Because he could have sealed it and made it impossible for you to even imagine that. But think about that. God can do everything but be less than 
God and still be God. Is that right? Can God be less than himself? So he left something that he can't do. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in his image and after his likeness. The only difference is, there's only one thing he can't do and millions that he can. And there's millions of things that you can't do and one that you can. <laughs> and what's that one thing? Acknowledge God. <laughs> Did I lose you? The one thing God cannot be is less than himself and still be God. That's the only thing he cannot do. And he put that there purposely. That's the one thing out of millions. Put you on the opposite side of that. You hear that? What do you do? I can think of a million things you cannot do. But there's only one thing that you can really do. And that's accept God. You know what? That's important. Because if you don't accept God, nothing else here is happening. <laughs> nothing here is going on. There are no clocks ticking. There are no lights coming off and on. There are no babies crying. There are no flowers growing. You with me? If you don't accept God, if you don't accept the existence of a being that makes things happen pre you, then you have not accepted anything. If you accept that one thing first, then in fact you have accepted everything. That's what it means by the all. God is not in the all. God is not of the all. There's no definite article attached to all. We are the all. God is all. That's why the prayer went, I am in the, what? Love of the, the all first. Y'all check, make sure you got the first. All. And therefore the article disappears. I am in the love of the all. Then it comes back, all love is in me. So God who cannot be contained in the universe can fit in the hearts of every one of us, yet not there. <laughs> yet not there. What do I mean by that? God exists within you, yet he's not within you. If he was, you couldn't do the wrong thing. You know what I'm saying? But the day that you accept God and let God take control of you, then you won't be able to do the wrong thing. And the day that you do the wrong thing is the day you evict God. Are you ready to be that deep? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think any of us are ready to be that deep. I don't think any of us are ready to walk that path where we cannot make a mistake. Are we? I don't think so. There are people who will tell you they're ready to embrace God in the totality of God. But if you embrace God in the totality of God and let God take control of you, then you can't make another mistake. And the disappointment is, he doesn't go backwards. That will be going against his nature. So don't open up to God until you're ready. Be on the path to God. You understand? Be building a better character. Be becoming a better person. But don't open up to God until you are ready. Because the day you open up and he gets in, you can't close the door. Because he says, I open the door and what? No man shut it. But every preacher and teacher is telling this congregation, open up and let God in. You need God in you. They're banging tamarines in churches. Hey, cutie. And asking for God to possess them with the Holy Ghost, as they call it, or the Holy Spirit. Right? But the moment you are filled of the Holy Ghost, then you are pure. Is that right? And you can do no wrong. 
And if you do wrong, you're doing wrong by God now, not by man. So don't gather a bunch of people in rooms and bang on tambourines and call on God to possess them. And you're not ready to be possessed of God. We're working. We're working to better our character, to make us better people. I hope we are. To make ourselves better. We're working to help other people in the world other than ourselves, I hope so. But don't let nobody tell you to let God into your life. That's a saint tonic tactic. What is the possibility of you never doing another wrong thing? What is the possibility? They open the door for you to wrong God. I'd like to embrace God. I'd like God to take control of my life. But can I take control of the range when God's taking control of my life? You think, well, if he's in your life, then everything is straight. No, because you still have willpower. Something that you want. Something that you're proud of. You say self-determination. The right to make decisions. Women constantly tell their husbands, I got a mind, I'm not just a female, I think too. Right? Because we treat y'all like y'all don't have a mind. We treat y'all like y'all don't think. Is that right? Is that right, women? And we're right. <laughs> Did y'all fall for that one? I tell you. Fell right, but see, they ain't that right. Would men fall for that? No. No. Watch in a couple of minutes. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying? People, you gotta be careful when you're preaching and teaching to people because right knowledge is very strong. It's been dormant for so many centuries that when you start hitting people with so many facts, you overload them sometimes. I've been teaching for how many years? Some overloaded, see? Too many years. Too many years, actually. And I find out sometimes I'm talking to people and I stop and just change the subject. You know what I'm saying? I just change the subject and start joking or something because you realize that people are far more timid than you, than you know. That the mind is very much more delicate or fragile than you really know. And a person can be sitting there losing their mind you won't know it. Because all they're doing is saying, it's true. Too much truth after so many lies can be very dangerous. So you gotta learn how to, you talk to a person, and laugh and joke a little bit, and tell them a little, don't sit there on the corner and try to unload the whole Bible on them. And sometimes I say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I stay there for a little while and say, in the beginning, Rith Barashith, Elohim Barra, Arith Washamarin. In the very beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I just stay there and say, you hear that? And they go, no. Listen again. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You hear that? No. Listen again. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You hear that now? See? Y'all are waiting for something deep. See how you, you've uh, like perched yourself in your mind like you like Y'all sat back and say, you can't say some deep. <laughs> you know, I can tell because his voice changed. He said, look, I stopped saying in the beginning, and I start saying, in the beginning. <laughs> See, I dropped the voice down to the deep voice. God created heaven and earth. I could have kept going, you know, y'all just said, in the beginning. God created the heavens. Heavens and earth. And you know what? If I would do that long enough, some people would have said, Oh, I got it. <laughs> I wasn't saying nothing, but in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. You got it? Anybody else got it? Huh? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's the first line in the Bible. Now let me explain to you all what in the beginning God created the heaven and earth means. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's what it means. You know how you know that's what it means? Because that's what it says. There ain't nothing to that. And anybody start adding stuff on there, it's crazy. 
<laughs> and you gotta recognize them. That's what it says in the Bible. When you see that spirit, test that spirit. Say, give them a quote out of the Bible and say, you know, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. What does that mean? And there's people on the right line and say, let me tell you. Because when God said, in the beginning, they're going with a whole other dialogue. Then Farrakhan told them. Who got it from Elijah? Who got it from Ford? Who got it from the Freemasons? Who got it from the... You feel what I'm saying? There's always somebody trying to add to the truth. To that which is simple, factual. Because belief is a religion. You need people believing if you want to advocate some type of religious commitment. Because if you tell them enough facts back to back, it changes from a religion into what? If you continue to keep people believing things, you can get people to do anything you want. The world is in an uproar today. It's not being done by political scientists. It's not being done by archaeologists, paleontologists. They're not blowing up people and killing each other. It's religious people that keep the world in turmoil. You understand? They just passed a new bill. You know what it says? That high schools can be used for Christian services after school. They just passed the bill. And yet we can't have prayer in school in the morning. Something wrong here? Is something loose? You might tell you this, this is what happens. This is what the society does to you. It tells a woman, like I said years ago, that she can go to the beach with a bikini on, but if you knock on her door and she has a slip on, she'll tell you to wait. You met this girl on the beach this afternoon, and she had a string up the crack of her butt, that's all. Two little things like band-aids hiding her breast. That was it. She was walking down the beach, loose and bouncing. Right? You meet her and say, I'm gonna come by and pick you up at eight o'clock so we can go to dinner. And you get there a little early, and you knock on the door and she says, just a minute. I'm in my slip. Slip, slip is a full length satin gown from full length arms covering everything. She won't let you see her in a slip, but she'll let you see her on a beach almost buck naked. If that ain't some type of mental trap or spell, something is wrong. Somebody is inside of our heads turning knobs. Anytime you want to see body parts, you sick people. You know what I mean by that? You hear there's an accident. You see the lights, you drive by doing this here. <laughs> Trying to see on the floor where there's body parts. Hoping to see the blood. Is that not right? They call it rubbernecking. And people drive by and say, acting over here. I ain't seen nothing. You seen nothing? I saw a foot. There's always a foot. Because shoes have a contract with God that they only stay on people when they're walking. I'm serious. I know I talked to God. He lives upstairs two doors away from me. Did you notice that? Whenever there's an accident, shoes have a way of getting out of it. Person can be knocked up in the air 30 feet, shoot me right there. I don't care if he was shot, hit by a truck, fell out of a plane. Niggas drown, they shoot me up on this right up on the bed. Right up in there. Niggas didn't have to do. What is it that shoes have a special pack where they manage to get out of a situation? Probably if the nigga stayed in his shoes, he wouldn't have accident. That's an abstract reality. That's an abstract reality that you laugh at, but it's real. And you can't explain it. Like your obsession with seeing someone hurt. Or, this movie is guaranteed to scare the hell out of you. You actually give somebody your money to go in a dark room with a 30 foot damn screen after I said, this movie is guaranteed to scare the heck out of you. You actually go in there, excuse me, brother, sit up there and sit back there. Or with pop back there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, you do. 
And if you're with a woman, you can't front you doing say that. Don't you guys just don't worry about it. <laughs> right? But you go back to the cinema again and see a horror movie. Something is sick about us. Is that not right? Something inside is not working. You follow me? And in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I think it was appropriate because it was nice and quiet. Everybody was listening. You understand? This tells us we need correcting. We need a new way of thinking, a new pattern of thinking, new concepts. And you know when they're going to come? Well, we give him back his bowl. Because all of that came with him. All of that type of thinking came with the white man. You know what I'm saying? He's the one who got us wanting to watch people get cut up. All you got to do is turn to his programs. You get a bunch of big old cars with big wheels just crashing into them. They got a program now where they make machines and the machines just crash up other machines. Battle bots. And this is entertainment to Caucasians. You know what I'm saying? Boxing with gloves was not enough. Now they have He-Man fighting and what is the other one? Where they actually get in the ring, people, and fight bare fists, right? Tough man contests. Regular boxing was no longer fun because niggas were winning. See? Golf ain't gonna be no fun soon with Tiger Wood around. You understand? Now they got seven brothers in hockey. We talked about that years ago. They gave seven African spears. <laughs> seven Africans with spears on ice. You understand what I'm saying? And you know a nigga with a stick in his hand with white people coming at him on ice is not going to be thinking about a pup. But I bet you within a couple of years we're going to have some black hockey stars. The number one chess champion in the world is a nigga. That's right. Is that right? What is happening to his system? You know what's happening? We're breaking away from it and the divinity is starting to develop in us. And as the divinity develops in us, you know what we're doing? We're using that old black magic to pull <coughs> sarcophagus out the ground. We're bringing Osiris and them back to life. Because now they're talking about Osiris in Egypt. And as they talk about the discovery of Osiris, Muslims are getting mad. So they go to China and they think by tearing down a Buddhist statue, they're going to tear down Buddha. And all they did is brought the world's consciousness to Buddha, who didn't even know there was Buddha statues in Afghanistan. And then some people didn't know who Buddha was, and then they said, who's Buddha? Who's the statue they tearing down? And someone had to explain to them who Buddha was, and what they did is advocated or propagated Buddhism in the stupidest way. This is what's happening to us right now. Egypt is coming in, it's coming in fast. You follow? You're on the wall, no doubt about it. You have any doubts about your face being on the wall? No doubt about it. You found who you are. Give up all other nationalities, all other races, and say, I am a Nwapi. That's my race. That's my nationality. What's a Nwapi? Me. Well, I know some people who are from the Dominican Republic who call themselves Nwapi. They are Nwapis. They just happen to be born in the Dominican Republic, but they're Nwapians by race. Make it a race. Make it a nationality. Doesn't mean you're not respecting the American government when here or the British government when you're there because if you don't do that, then they have laws to restrict you or confine you or call you subversive or anti this. Well, everybody's anti everything who thinks in this country. But be a Nwapian, learn the language, get the language into the kids. You follow what I'm saying? Because it'll be interesting one day when you're just walking along and you just start talking in your language to your kids. In the walking, you look at the Caucasian's face. We've done it before. They go, excuse me. Say what? Uh, where are you from? Brooklyn. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, I mean originally. Oh. Bushwick Avenue, Brooklyn. <laughs> Where 
What language are you speaking? Ancient Egyptian. What? Gladys. <laughs> Go ahead. Do, 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 the do the thing. These niggas mean to me. These people <laughs> are speaking their own language. That is the birth of a nation. Do you realize that those children will have an accent? If you start them speaking their language now, they'll have an accent. Do you know that the ancient Egyptian language is put together in a way that if you master it, you also be simultaneously mastering Arabic, Hebrew, Aramic, Gese, and Amharic simultaneously? That the bridge to those other dialects are as simple as learning their alphabets and how certain vowels are shifted? Phonetics. That you'll be able to speak to an Arab in Arabic or Hebrew in Hebrew, which is no such thing actually, but we'll go for the time in. You understand what I'm trying to do? And because they see how close I am to succeeding, where a lot of other so-called black leaders fail, there's a concentrated effort to stop them. They'll do anything to stop us, especially now. Because where is our opposition? In other words, like it says, who can stand against us now? Who can? Five percent? Sunnis? Ahmadiyya? Who? Freemasons? I know things about Freemasons that they don't know. They're asking me. Who can stand against us now? We have crossed the hardest part of the journey across the desert. And anybody who's followed me from years, from Brooklyn, I told them, I said, what we're doing is we're crossing the desert and the sun is behind us and we better be more than halfway across that desert before high noon. Because when that's above us, if we're not strong enough to make it, we're not going to make it. And if your friend falls down when we get near noon, you can't go back and get him or her. That's what Christ said. Many of them have fallen asleep. Right? Don't think everybody's going to make it that you like. Many are called, yet few are chosen. All of us are not going to make it. Yeah? Some of y'all are going to fall out the boat. It's a hard, rough journey across the desert. And the oases are few and far. The path is rough at times and smooth at others. So everybody is not made to make it. Call Allah Ta'ala fil Quran, wa tasmu bil habli Allahi jamia, wa la tafarraku. That means hold on to the rope of God and don't separate. That means hold on. Why would God put something like that in a holy book? Why we put something like that in a scripture? Hold on and don't let go. Because he knew there'd be trying times for us. Hard times. We went through a battle for some of you folks that are new around here. We went through a battle with demons in Putnam County. We warred against these devils, am I right? They did everything in their power to take this land and make sure that what's happening right now does not go on. They tried every trick in the book. They ain't finished. They tried slander, defamation of character. They tried to lock brothers up, harass sisters on the street, stop every car coming down and make sure. They did everything they could and not one person come out and help us. Why? Because they had us marked as a cult. Oh, there's some crazy suicide cult. Let me sit down for a minute here. And I'll say what I've been saying to y'all for years. Please name one black suicide cult. Name one suicide cult. Don't say the ones in Africa because they were under European missionaries. Do a little research. Don't say Jim Jones. Jim Jones was what? And that wasn't even suicide. That's one of the biggest hoax they tell you. It was about diamonds. It's about oil in Guyana. There's rubies in Guyana. 
There's wealth in Guyana. They was over there mining. And some governor's daughter got hooked up and fell in love with one of the guys who worked over there. You understand? And when the governor went over there to play a uh, cult buster to snatch his daughter out, he came in with a military force and had a shootout because the people there were there to protect the diamonds. Go back and study. We were, us older folks were here when it was taking place. So when them planes came in, the security there to protect the diamonds, they were using the so-called people to dig, to sort out Guyanese gold. Guyanese gold was coming in the country because America was going to trick the niggas. Because during that time, everybody was starting to wear gold bangles. And Guyanese gold is like cowboy gold. It's not real, but it looks real. Like half of you women who got zirconias on your finger and think you got diamonds. It look real. They had plans. And their plans were aborted because of one governor or senator who went over there and had got shot. And then they went in and massacred the people and said they took poison. But they slipped. They said they took cyanide poison. And you can't take cyanide poison and lay on the ground. You bounce around, you bounce around, you get cramps, you jump up. You can't take cyanide and lay like this and die. You can do that if someone's firing above you. If someone's shooting above your head, you will naturally lay down and come the way they found those bodies. But they'll tell us to shut the public up. Oh, cult suicide. Everybody over in uh, Heaven's Gate, they went out and bought new sneakers, new knapsacks, new blankets, and then committed suicide. Please tell me why a person would buy new sneakers, new knapsack, and new blankets. I understand the knapsack and blankets. I don't understand why a dead person needs sneakers, new sneakers, if they knew they were gonna commit suicide. Huh? But what most people don't know is that your hoarder, you know who your hoarder is? Star Trek. Her brother was a part of that group. And she has been dormant as an actress since Star Trek went off and just started getting parts. And got a little money. And wanted her brother out of that cult. You understand? Because her career was in jeopardy of her being exposed to have a brother that belongs to what they consider a fanatical cult. And because she's a religious icon in America, to be a part of Star Trek, you're like a god or a goddess. They did her a favor and wiped. I'm not saying that guy wasn't crazy. They made sure they got a picture when you saw him looking crazy. They have killed those people. And then, oh, religious cult suicide. That's what they were saying about us. Oh, we're afraid that they, we heard they gather around the pyramid over there and they're going to, the year 2000, he's going to command them and they're all going to commit suicide. I said, that's because y'all don't know niggas. <laughs> yeah, I know I belong to a cult. We're doing this here. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean. You know how they say, we're going to commit suicide. Who them black men see you? That shows white folks just don't know niggas. Because niggas, we ain't into suicide. Good, <laughs> Good night. <laughs>